So Jessica, warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know you from the Deep Adaptation Forum where you have been an active member of the community, volunteering and supporting the, the building of the community. And I do know a little bit more about, um, you know, your life outside of this, this community and particularly around the fact that um, deep adaptation has had a big impact on the choices you make about how you live. Um, and I wonder, just as we start, would you um, say a little bit more about yourself by way of introduction so that people here can can get to know you a bit more and, and have a, a bit more of an understanding about your journey to deep adaptation? Sure. And thank you, Katie, for the invitation. It's uh, really special to be part of the Q&A series. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, also thank you for people who are tuning in from different parts of the world, especially my mother-in-law and her friend Morgana from Muskoka in Ontario. Um, the, uh, yes, it's um, where to begin. Uh, I don't want to talk too much. I have a little video to show to give people sort of a concept and idea of where I am based, which is in the Eastern Caribbean in Dominica. It's a small island, not to be confused with the Dominican Republic, which is a Spanish speaking. We are much further south of that. Uh, and I'm actually at my friend's farm this morning because uh, we were doing some tree trimming at our place and a branch fell on the internet line. So I don't have internet currently, but Karen has a lovely organic farm as she's a neighbor of ours. Um, and I've been for the last about two years, two and a half years uh, involved in the forum. I kind of discovered it during lockdown. Um, we have a property in the mountains here at 1500 feet, uh, at the edge of a rainforest, and we have a retreat center where we invite people in to have group experiences, predominantly transformational experiences, students, artists, um, plant medicine, um, groups, local groups as well, and it's, uh, it's something that has evolved over time. As you can tell by my accent, I'm Canadian as well, Dominican Canadian. So I spent my first part of my life uh, growing up in Canada and studying at University of Toronto. And then with my partner, Tim, we discovered um, that we didn't want to be in the north, that we realized that we wanted to, to live a really creative off, off the beaten path life. So we came here to Dominica, which happens to be my ancestral home as well. Um, my father's side, uh, our Dominican. So I'm a hyphenated individual and uh, having spent half my life in the industrial north and now half my life in the um, subsistent and um, agrarian south, I have a, a kind of an interesting understanding of, of the predicament we face and, um, and how possible ways to adapt. But first of all, before I go into that, I'd like to show a quick um, one minute video. My favorite thing about Cappy Cottage is probably just the whole purpose of it and all the motives behind it. Tim and Jess really just built a place where you can learn to connect with nature and appreciate the island. And I'm so happy to have had my experience here and be able to bring all this stuff home. À la Dominique, est juste incroyable. Yoga should be in nature. It's a good balance. Uh, eh ben, l'endroit est fantastique. L'eau de la rivière. She's wonderful. It's a comfortable tent. Really just a transformative experience where you were just one with nature. Uh, really in the middle of the nature, we have the waterfalls uh, very close. We can hear the water falling when sleeping, when resting, when walking. It's amazing. The chefs know how to make the food really, really good. It's the perfect uh, environment to host any kind of group, really. On ne peut que se ressourcer. Voilà. I love the tent. Yeah, I love the tent. It was really uh, luxurious. I think it's a perfect place for a retreat. Whether it's for a yoga retreat, an artist retreat, plant medicine, meditation, mindfulness, wonderful hosts, a really special energy. So 
so that's where I am. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's been a labor of love over the past uh, almost 30 years that I've been based here with my partner um, and our daughter. And uh, it's been a real, oh, we just lost my mother. <laughs> it's been a real journey. And um, um, I didn't expect actually any of this. It just sort of all has been an unfolding journey. Um, and before um, finding the property and building the retreat center, we had a production company, we still do, Link International Productions. And we've been field producers um, in the Caribbean and Latin America. This was before YouTube. So for um, internationally syndicated shows like media television, fashion television, sex TV even, and basically bringing stories from the region to international audiences. Uh, and that's a big passion of ours as well. We also had worked in development education, working with young people on creating student exchanges between India and Canada and the Caribbean. Um, and so really looking at issues that affect um, people sort of on the edge of the empires, um, very interested in um, life in the Caribbean and Latin America and how we can have sort of a conversation um, with the global north um, and bringing those issues um, to light. Thanks, Jessica. Incredibly rich. And um, you're going to be hosting a deep adaptation, deep live gathering later this year as well, aren't you? Yes, that's right. So we're really excited to be doing a deep live gathering here in, in October when the international gatherings are happening and um, working with Dorian um, on that and content. And something that we do is monthly, we have monthly gatherings. I'm very big on intergenerational gatherings. And so we talk about these issues um, once a month on our porch. Um, it's quite open, uh, as well as doing more formal group things. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to um, make sure that the link to Deep Live Gatherings is included in the show notes on YouTube for this video, um, because they are happening all over the world. Yeah, people being able to make connections and meet with people in real life. Um, so yeah, very exciting. So I'm going to um, I'm going to I yeah ask you more about the um, film production and particularly your love in action series, the current one you're working on. I'll ask that a little bit, um, but I know that um, yeah I, I think you've been involved in in some of the the work in in the Deep Adaptation Forum around trying to shift the narrative around collapse being, you know, this, this very white westernized framing of it's a bad thing that's gonna happen and it's gonna happen to us. And it's a, you know, it's a distinct event. Um, and yeah, the importance of including the reality of people who have lived through kinds of collapses. Um, and so, I, yeah, I really, really, grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you about your experience of um, Hurricane Maria when it hit Dominica in I think about five years ago. So yeah. if you would be happy to share something about that experience and and afterwards as well what you experienced and what you witnessed. Sure um, I think certainly people in the north are getting more of an understanding of the climate breakdown um, uh, but we in the Global South have been experiencing this for, for decades and uh, stronger and more devastating storms, especially in the hurricane belt where we are, um, are part of life and we prepare every year for hurricane season. Uh, but in 2017, um, we had uh, a category five, which is the highest, strongest storms um, to be recorded on the planet. And uh, it actually went right through Dominica. Most people heard about Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico but it actually hit Dominica first. Uh, and it just absolutely devastated the island. Um, it, most buildings were flattened or lost their roofs. All the infrastructure was destroyed. The, the agriculture, what you see behind me would have just been sticks, absolutely no green. Um, there was, you know, it was just, it was, it was my understanding of collapse. It was my first experience of, of complete and utter um, devastation. And it, I mean, talking now, I can sort of speak more abstractly about it, um, but it was, it was probably the most challenging thing that I've ever lived through. Um, 
the most heart-wrenching, um, disorienting um, experience. Um, not just the storm itself, which killed uh, over 60 people, um, but the aftermath, which went on for not days or weeks, but months. There was no power on the island for almost 10 months. Um, there were no roads, um, bridges were out. Um, and it, it really um, forced everybody to go back into sort of survival mode and what are, what are, what are essential, what is essential in this, in this time and everything else is just trivial. Because when you go through something like that, your whole world is, is reoriented uh, and you really get to what's important. And it's, it's interesting because at that point I had the choice to leave you know, I could, I could have fled and gone back to Canada and I have family there and I would have, you know, been safe and not have to worry about it. But uh, I chose to stay, uh, we chose to stay and rebuild, um, not just because it was my home for the last, you know, 25 years, but because of what I saw in terms of the community coming together uh, and supporting one another. I mean, the morning after this unbelievable storm, uh, women came out of their houses and were washing clothes and were doing their laundry. You know, people were going, picking up food uh, that had fallen and, and sharing it. Uh, nobody was running around screaming and panicking. Nobody was sitting around, you know, waiting for someone to save us. It was just people picked themselves up and we all talked and sat and, and were together and, and started, you know, the process of rebuilding and recovering. Um, and this is something that I think um, is quite not unique in the world because I think most of the world who's not part of the industrial north kind of expects these disasters, has lived through many, uh, expects that we have to do a lot of community self-care um, uh, and we have these informal networks where we're just um, very used to doing things for ourselves uh, and coming together as a community. So, you know, for instance, we have, most people in, in our community have skills, basic skills like carpentry, stone masonry, electrical, plumbing skills, sewing. And so we dug ourselves out. We got our roads cleared. We got our water system back. Um, people were going around gathering galvanized and putting, putting roofs back on um, long before we had any formal support um, coming into the village, long before we even had rations. And, and what you saw was over time, people just started losing weight. It was interesting, you know, you could just, we all lost about 20 pounds over the, the first months. Um, but we, we all survived, you know, we all um, figured out how to come together and survive. As I'm listening to you describe your experience, I'm thinking about the fact that um, yeah, it's very different. I imagine I imagine it's very different to how the um, communities or societies that I'm part of in Northern Europe might respond. But I'm also uh, having a kind of amused smile because, yeah, in all of the contexts in which I've heard mutual aid discussed, it's always got a capital M and a capital A. You know, it's understood as a, a project which is implemented for building community. Um, yeah, which it sounds like this, yeah, this is something which exists and doesn't need to be capitalized in the context that you're talking about. Yes, well, Dominica has a long tradition, we call it coup de main. Uh, coup de main is the Creole word for lend a hand, and Creole is our uh, local language. It's a mix between French, the colonizer's language, and Af an African grammatical structure. Uh, and coup de main has been part of our culture for hundreds of years. Uh, and that is a community self-help where we all are part of the community. And it happens in many, many places around the world where there isn't a lot of money. You know, there isn't a big market that sort of mediates relationships and commerce between people. So when there isn't a lot of money and everyone is really kind of in the same position, we have to help each other. We need each other. And so there is this tradition and it's how my ancestors survived you know, as slaves uh, and as maroons, uh, you had to be in each other's lives in an intimate way and sharing your skills and knowledge, so informally. So nobody's keeping track, you know, nobody's, 
uh, remember Katie, we were talking about time banks. So there's no sort of, oh, well, you did this for me on Tuesday, so I'm going to do this many hours for you on Friday. No, it's just, you know, your neighbor shows up with a goat because you were helping, you know, clear his, his area for farming. And it's just, it's a, an informal way of, of being together and living and exchanging um, skills and knowledge and, and services. And it's really the glue that uh, keeps the community together. Um, it's a social glue. And I think that we've really lost that uh, in industrial complex societies because you don't have to rely on your neighbors. You have Walmart down the street, you know, you've got a YMCA where you can go, you've got a movie theater, you don't, so you don't have to, and that the market has really destroyed that natural uh, propensity for people to gather and, and to be in community with each other, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, um, yeah, an industrial consumer society encourages, champions hyper individualism and independence. And the idea of reaching out to, to help, of being indebted to somebody, is, is almost associated, it's almost similar to being indebted financially, isn't it? There's, there's shame around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was speaking with Eric the other day and uh, we were talking about mutual aid and uh, there was a, a, a kind of a truism that was going around during COVID. I heard it was, um, we're all in the same boat. You know, there was, we're all in the same boat. So we're all gonna pull together and we're all gonna do what's best for everybody. Uh, and I, I, I heard a quote from Meg Wheatley who said, well, we're all in the same storm. You know, we're all in the same crisis, but we're in very different boats. You know, some of us are in mega yachts, <laughs> some of us are in little dinghies, some of us don't even have a boat, and some of us are in the water and we can't swim. And so there's no concept of really, truly being all in this together. And I think with mutual aid and with building community, you really have to have a sense of that, that you really do need each other. And so that there is this, is what emerges from that understanding and awareness is ethical behavior so you naturally want to protect your neighbor and you naturally want to help out and you naturally want to serve. And I think the service part, it might be what's, what's kind of missing um, from, from places where they're struggling to have healthy communities. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like a connection between what you said and your work in documentary making and the theme around like I can I can hear very very strongly the the social justice the fairness aspect of of what you're saying and how you're saying it and um yeah I'm guessing that that was part of what led you into uh the kind of work that you that you do with your partner Tim is that right yes yeah absolutely um really interested in giving voice and amplifying the ideas and, and experiences of people um, who are, uh, you know, outside um, of areas where um, it's, it's easy to do things. And it's, it's um, so I want to, before I get into that, I, I, I'll, I think I'll, to get an idea of the show, what we're doing, I'll, I'll show this very short clip. Let me just see if I can find it. I have to close this down. So we started, my, my feeling was that I wanted to open up the conversation to people in different parts of the world that were really um, revolutionaries. And I use the term revolutionary in a sense that they um, understand the crisis, this incredible predicament, knowing what we're losing, but are acting anyway. They're acting on their love and their compassion to try and save what's left of the natural world, to try to transform um, our communities into into something that's more fair and just um, and doing amazing things um, collectively around the world. So I'm just going to play this very short trailer. Solution. Invitation. Deep resistance. From a deep love. Welcome to Love in Action at Capi Cottage in Dominica in the Eastern Caribbean. And today we have the enormous privilege of being able to have a chat with Skina Rathor, who is a co-finder of Extinction Rebellion. 
the ecological and climate justice movement. Jem, in his magnificence, kind of hijacked that that conference with his deep adaptation presentation. And Gail Bradbrook was a dear friend of mine. So when I got home from the conference, utterly shaken and stirred and devastated, devastated by the science that Jem revealed, and primarily because as a mother, what he was saying was that my children would probably really unlikely to experience a full adulthood. And I just decided that I wanted to stand in it too and for restoration, uh, transformative reparations, transformative adaptations and deep adaptations repair, you know, reweaving the human family for the protection of life and earth repairs. That's the being the change work now. Today we have the amazing privilege to speak with rainbow eyes of the Danaktawa Awitlala Nation of the Knight Inlet on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. So by the second arrest, we know we can resist. Like, not like fight, but nobody walks willingly with the RCMP. You, you have to work. You are putting us in jail. You're making us criminals. So, and they would be in hard blocks for maybe three days with police all around. So ceremony was introduced by the elders for healing, to help heal yeah. each other. Laura Schmidt, who is the founder, one of the founders of the Good Grief Network. I think part of the heart-centered re revolution or love in action is really about appealing to the nature of humanity and never losing hope in that, in that ability to connect and that ability to be inspired and pursue meaning and joy. I think that's the real crux Okay, so that was just a taste of a few of the stories that we've um, developed and uh, more to come. But just to give, it gives you a sense of, um, uh, yeah, the idea that we can be inspired by these kinds of collective actions. And there's a lot going on around the world. And, uh, um, you know, Katie and I were talking earlier and, you know, Deep adaptation gets labeled a lot as being doomers and doomerous and uh, oh, if we if we know the truth, if we know too much, we just won't act, we'll put our heads in the sand. And I think it's the opposite. I think people who really have that sense of the the magnitude and the dev and the, the magnitude of the loss that's happening and that's happened, um, then there is more motivation to to try and save what's left and to try to um, work with the, the best of humanity, you know, to transform the system to transform ourselves uh, and, to, and to start to create a, a new world on the other side. Yeah, really powerful. I, I get a really strong sense of um, that it takes so much courage to, to step out of business as usual, but in, you know, in such a strong, powerful way. And that you know, looking you know, being able to face into the truth and doing it with other people can be a massive motivator for that courage. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rainbow Eyes, you saw the Forest Defender, she was actually um, just named um, and accepted the role of uh, deputy leader of the Green Party of Canada. Uh, and that was after the, we, did, we did that piece with her. And she decolonized the name as well for deputy leader. So she, it's going to be interesting journey for her now from the outside to come into a political party and see what she can do in, internally to, to start to shift things. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you one more question myself, um, and then we're gonna open up to questions to the people who are here. So I just want to, to yeah, remind people here if you would like to ask uh, or send a question for Jessica, you don't have to ask it yourself, please post them to Stuart now on the, in, using the chat box. So my last question is this. So you are um, deeply immersed in, uh, yeah, in deep adaptation. I, in your, it sounds like there's not that much of a, it's not a work thing. This is part of your life, um, you know, dedicating yourself in, in work and in your community to extending the glide, softening the crash, whatever that means in, in your context. Um, I want to know how you stay sane. I want to know about your 
emotional resilience what keeps you grounded what keeps you your nervous system uh, regulated well the first thing is all this <laughs> keeps me regulated uh, being living immersed in nature um, and I knew I wanted to to live somewhere beautiful and uh, uh, that's absolutely I can't understate that um, how the natural environment helps to regulate me and um, keep me connected and then I have a morning yoga practice um, yoga and meditation that I do every morning very very key to to starting the day off right and to calming all the nervous system and all of the wonderful benefits of yoga and meditation. Uh, and then community, um, surrounding myself with good people, um, being involved. I think that's a huge um, medicine, you know, to, to continually to be involved. And I'm involved with the farmers group here, village council and working with young people. Uh, and there's just so much to do to connect. And every time I you know, step off my property and into the village. Uh, there's just this, you know, I learn something new. I just the smiles that are there, sharing smiles, sharing ideas. And, uh, um, and I have an amazing family as well. And uh, I amazing family support um, after the hurricane uh, from my mother in law, Sandy and my parents and were just incredibly supportive because they also believe in, in what we're doing and why we're here. And I think all of that, um, this kind of forms this, um, this container, this basket, these, these arms uh, around us and we're able to continue. Yeah, I love that, that image, the, the holding, the basket, yeah, the container. And I'm more and more, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the, your experience during the hurricane, about the connection between what we experience as seemingly an individual nervous system and how it's not it's it's connected through you know it's it's contingent upon community and belonging which makes it immediately a a, a collective thing it makes resilience a kind of shared experience yeah absolutely we really regulate each other's nervous systems you know if somebody mm -hmm. is you really really feel the energy of other people um, and if people are calm uh, and are taking time and slowing down before they make decisions, then it, it affects you as well. You're able to take that time and to slow down. But if people are panicky and nervous and angry, that's very contagious as well. So um, we're very fortunate that people are generally, I think it's also living close to the land. You feel very grounded. You're, it's a different rhythm when you're surrounded by by green and when you're working in the soil and uh, so I think that's all part of it. Thank you. So uh, the first question is uh, is from Stuart. Um, thanks Jessica. Um, I've heard that our response as a species to collapse will be dictated by the speed of said collapse. Um, a rapid collapse has historically brought people together as it clearly did um, with you after the storm, whereas a slow one will most likely put one against the other. Um, and I know this latter scenario is a big concern amongst people who are collapse aware in, uh, in the main DA group. So I wonder what your experience is around this idea. Not uh, for any wisdom. Sure. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. I think um, collapse or, you know, simplification, disintegration of systems, I think happens in waves. I don't, I think, you know, collapse is already in motion in different parts of the world. Um, it's just unevenly distributed. So I don't see a sort of a, a one time, one day you wake up and the entire world has collapsed. I think, I think it's going to be kind of these waves where one area is going to experience a disaster and we'll be able to rebuild. And then the next time we might not be able to rebuild as far, you know, and there'll be, things will be simplified and um, we'll have to live differently. And I think that um, there was one uh, quote that that comes to mind. I think complexity is not your friend. So I think if you're in a very complex place uh, and in, in, in a city, I think it's it's going to be more of a shock for people because um, as things degrade, you know, systems, supply chains um, degrade underneath you because you're very high up on this complexity ladder, um, it will be a little bit harder to manage, you know, uh, so I think it's, 
I don't, I don't see a Mad Max scenario though. I really, I think that's the Hollywood scenario. Um, I think people genuinely uh, are good and want to help each other and want to help one another. I think they'll always be the preppers, you know, out on the fringes um, who have their bunkers. But I think generally the best parts of humanity come out in a disaster. And even in a place where there's, you know, thousands of people living together, I think you have these we saw that with Hurricane Sandy in New York, you know, you have these mutual aid groups springing up and you have neighborhoods coming together to, to deliver services and things. Um, but I think it won't, you know, it'll be very uneven and it'll be kind of in waves and people will have to adapt to kind of the new reality as things uh, move along. Thank you. Gives me some comfort. <laughs> Um, I've got a question from Kat. She's asked me to, to read it out. Um, Kat says she'd like to hear about your plans. What's, so what's next for you um, personally, but also, uh, yeah, collectively? Kat says um, that she, you have a unique perspective and that she would love to hear what you are sensing. Mm, that's interesting. Um, well, in the, in the near term, I'm sensing uh, I would love to um, uh, take some time to travel again, if, if, if I can travel. Uh, my daughter is, uh, has just graduated high school and is taking a life year. So I'm really focused on what we can do as a family um, while she's around before she goes off to university. Um, so really um, less structure, I think. I read something around... Um, that there's this great resignation and that a lot of boomers are retiring early and taking time off and just, you know, it's almost like a sabbatical. So I feel like I'd like to take, um, I've been kind of in the trenches focused on, you know, all these different projects. I kind of would like to take some time and space to just get more expansive and connect with friends around the world. Um, and then, uh, and then it's not so clear, you know, I have some, we have some plans for our property um, that we'd like to look at getting a lot more local. Um, we, we've been hosting people from different parts of the world for the last few years, but I know what's coming in the, in the future is going to be a much more local way of living. Uh, and so I want to be able to um, create more opportunities for young people and, and programs uh, at the local level. So those are a couple things, but you know, it's, it's all, everything emerges over time because it's such a, <laughs> it's such a strange time. We just have no idea what's going to happen. The whole world could shut down again for the next, the next thing. So hard to know. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Eric, would you like to ask your question? Sure, I would. Um, I actually had submitted two of them and I don't know if you had one in mind or, or the other, but I'll ask I the first one. I got one. So you choose. Okay. Uh, you mentioned plant medicine that you do at, uh, at your cottage. And I guess I'm curious what exactly you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, different plants. Uh, we have a lot of plants. Um, one of them is uh, that we have done ceremonies with, with ayahuasca. I don't know if you're familiar with ayahuasca um, yeah. uh, and various plants, um, but it's, uh, it's kind of on request when people are interested in things. And um, I think it's, it's amazing. There's so much potential um, and so much healing potential from plants. Uh, and they are in the process of being, you know, decriminalized in many parts of the world, these um, psychedelic plants because of the benefits that they can give. So I don't want to take up too much time discussing it. Um, that's more of a question for my partner, Tim. But, um, but yeah, we can talk about that, Eric, <laughs> if you're ready to come down. And it's, uh, yeah, there's just so much potential, I think, in, in helping people reconnect with themselves and with, with the earth. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, another question from Kat. Kat. I think yeah, you're here now, so you can um, you can unmute yourself and speak directly to Jessica. 
Thank you. I notice I'm feeling very greedy and taking advantage of there being fewer faces on the screen. So please forgive me or thank you for your indulgence might be a nicer way of saying it. Jessica, I had a curiosity. I've been so lucky to spend time with you on screen over the last two and a half years. And I have an overwhelming sense of deep um, generosity from you and it, in all things. And it's noticeable for me who spent most of my life in that very white, very Western, the house of modernity, if you like, uh, where, as Katie said, we're, we're trained and indoctrinated into this idea of the selfish self. You know, it's all about me. It's all about my independence. But I just wanted to invite, and I know it's difficult, I just wanted to invite some reflections from you around the idea of generosity that I, I think for in the West, there's often this sense of I, I can't give it, I can't give it away because I need it. And I sense that your perspectives on generosity are perhaps quite different. And I just wanted to invite a reflection from you, please. Mm, thanks for that, Kat. Uh, and I've enjoyed spending time with you as well and getting to know you. Um, yeah, I've, I like the uh, the phrase generosity is generative, you know, generosity um, brings more generosity back to you, you know, and um, a lot of the time we talk about the energy that you put out in the world, you know, comes back to you in different forms, but it, it's that same energy. So if it's a negative energy and if it's a tight and, and scared and um, scarcity energy, then that's really what kind of shows up for you. So, and I do sense that that's been my kind of experience is the more that I step out of myself and out of my own sort of small me um, to, to take in other perspectives and to, and to share, the more I get back. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's easier to do that when you're in a small community. You know, I think small is really beautiful because um, you have to see everybody, you know, all the time. And there's so many places that you interact. Um, and it's just, it becomes something that's really emergent and everybody's sort of encouraged to be generous, you know, and it goes back to that idea of service. If you have a healthy community, then there's a lot of service going on. There's a lot of volunteer work going on. Um, so many people, you'd be amazed at how hard they work at their paid jobs, whether they're gardeners or plumbers or electricians, but also how much time they give, you know, outside of that and not expecting anything in return. And that's something that's always, you know, kind of blown me away about uh, the Caribbean in particular. And, um, and it goes back to that, that sense of um, collective self-help, you know, and that coup de main. There is, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Thanks for the question and your response, Jessica. There is also, as I'm listening, I'm thinking about what, what you've said about um, Dominica and the, the fact that it is very unusual in terms of ample rain, you know, the, the, and fertile soils. And it is a place of abundance. And yeah, my sense is that does make it easier for us to relax into connection and generosity. Yeah, yeah, and I should add too, it is, uh, and Tim always reminds me, you know, Dominica is not the norm when it comes to small islands. You know, our neighbors to the south, St. Lucia or Barbados to the east um, are much drier, much flatter, have many, many more people, uh, and they don't have rainforest anymore. They don't have a lot of their uh, colonization of course, destroyed much of those natural ecosystems and people were moved off the land and into the service sector when tourism boomed. And so you have mass tourism. Most of the islands in the Caribbean uh, have a lot of tourism. And so people are disconnected from the land and a lot of people have forgotten the, these kinds of arts, farming, um, you know, stone masonry. Uh, uh, and my friends in St. Lucia say, you know, people don't remember, don't know how to farm here. And I'm thinking St. Lucia is just two islands south, but such a different development trajectory, you know, where um, everybody rushed into that industry, you know, in a big way um, and, and rushed for the money. And what they're finding now is they're much more food insecure uh, and they're having to relearn some of these basic things around farming and, and how to take care of the land kind of thing. So 
it, it is a unique place for sure. Okay, I'm going to um, go to Greg next. Greg, would you unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Great to be here, Jessica. And th uh, thank you for sharing your, uh, your beautiful place you have in, in Dominica. I'm coming to you from uh, North Florida. And we experienced quite a few hurricanes here as well. And um, right now we are, um, I'm, I'm coming off of a, a high from last night when we had a, a group of about a dozen politicians. We have elections taking place here in the, in the US right now. And Florida is, uh, at least our county, uh, is very aware of a climate emergency with sea level rise taking place. And um, our county happens to be a safe haven uh, in from the coastlines. And so initially I brought the climate emergency to our county uh, in preparation in 2019 um, after hearing uh, Jim Bendel's or reading his paper in 2018. And um, I guess my question is, you know, I, I saw you really helped put together some uh, connected the dots for me with XR and, and, uh, and Bendel's paper. And, um, you know, my thought is we foster a sense of resilience um, when we prepare each other emotionally and mentally for, uh, for catastrophes. And we, here in Florida, we're used to the idea of hurricanes. Uh, although for the last three years, we've been graced with very few hurricanes um, due to La Nina. Um, but we are kind of complacent in the sense that we were, we we're all in this together through this COVID thing, but we're not in the same boat. Like right now, I'm living in this beautiful loft apartment, um, but you know, I'm a, I, I ha I'm basically a refugee here uh, in a in a million dollar community on the lakeside, and I'm I'm at uh, I'm living here on their graces, so good graces, and and I'm finding myself in a position where I'm like. Uh, trying to reach out to these folks and let them know about the issues that, that are facing us in our terms of our immediate future and what we can do about it, uh, where I am in central Florida. And, um, and I, uh, I'm go going ahead. to try, I'm going to try and summarize for you. Thank Certainly. you, Greg, illustrating it's okay. So bringing it down to the, the fact that is it, do you think that a catastrophe is necessary to bring a community together or can the DA forum or deep adaptation in general foster a sense of resilience beforehand by by introducing the topic and engaging people? Right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, Greg. Thanks for your interest. And um, I, you know, in, in my experience, I love the forum. I think I've met so many amazing people, you know, online. I think the the major thing is, and I've always felt you need to be able to bring that online spirit and knowledge and awareness back into your local community, you know, for it to really have an impact. I think the future is local. And uh, I think it's wonderful to get inspired and to go out there and to meet people in different pockets. But I think it's absolutely key to bring it back into your local community so that you start to build a network where you live, you know, with your neighbors, because those are the people that you're going to be counting on when the internet goes down, <laughs> you know, and when supply chains stop, it's, it's going to be your neighbors, the people in your vicinity. Uh, and so uh, however it takes to bring them on board to, to open up your home or wherever you are to start those conversations, I think is, is a place to start. I think it's true that if a disaster hits, you definitely people out of necessity will come together, but it's best to start to make those networks now to figure out who you can count on. You know, I, I learned a lot from long before the hurricane who I could count on because I was working with them. I was volunteering with them on different projects, holding different events. And so I had this understanding of who people were, we were already connected. And so when disaster hits, it's kind of natural. These, these networks just, you know, kind of fire up and get into action and do what's needed. But if you can somehow, you know, really get to know who is around you in a, in a bigger way and who are the people that, you know, might, be able to to start that conversation with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, build on that a little bit, and um, yes, yeah, certainly what you said about uh, the Deep Adaptation Forum being like I think of it as a dojo. You know, there's a there's a lot of um, incredible and powerful work going on around um, people. Really, really. 
um, committing to I won't say decolonizing or divesting ourselves of the, all of the assumptions, all of the mainly invisible cultural narratives, which are about just do more quicker progress and achievement and and power um, and all of those all of that engagement that I've had in the forum has has impacted me it's really impacted on my my life with real humans made of meat um, and I wonder so that's what I'm curious about what in what ways um, does deep adaptation translate into your into your life mm -hmm. um, certainly it's it's really helped me to, um, I think, to more deeply accept um, uh, this. There's so much, yeah, there's so much there. I get pointed into different directions. There's so much content and resources um, that I've been introduced to that I wouldn't have uh, otherwise. Um, there's this idea that um, there are like minded people all over the world that are, are grappling with these massive questions and this complexity uh, and these interlocking crises um, and there's this there's this feeling it's a, and it's a very new thing I think it was just lockdown uh, being in lockdown I was online so much more and I and I really had a time to sit with these massive issues and then to start to talk to other people about them and the forum kind of curated all of that um, really beautifully uh, and then the I think the framework of the four R's is something that I've been really working with a lot. And actually all in the, in our series, I ask everybody about the four R's. Uh, are people familiar with that? Jem Bendel had suggested this framework um, for responding. So restoration, reconciliation, resilience, um, and there was one more. Um, I can't relinquishment. Remember. Relinquishment. And then a friend of mine said reverence should be in there too. And so, you know, how in this time can we sort of metabolize what's happening at an emotional and spiritual level? And what are the kinds of behaviors that we should be leaving behind? And what are the kinds of things that we should be moving towards? Um, and so that's also kind of a criteria I use to, to actually select my guests for the, for the series uh, and people who kind of embody that. Uh, and so, you know, that's just one area um, that, that that has been helpful for me in terms of the forum. But the other one is, um, which we talked about earlier, is having a deep live gathering. I'm curious to see how that will work with the sort of hybrid in-person gathering and online and being able to sort of link with, with what's happening in other spaces um, with, with the group. So there's, yeah, I'm still, I think I'm still kind of absorbing um, how the forum has impacted me <laughs> so it's a it's a complicated question but there's there's just uh yeah there's a lot there's a lot there um there's a lot of amazing people and it's yeah you would not have met you would not have been able to meet these people in any other way because they're in different parts of the world um so it's been this incredible way to curate um, people who you know are in your sphere in terms of understanding these issues right? Thank you. And uh, I'm going to ask Sandy. Sandy, you sent a question. Do you want to ask it now? Sure. Um, certainly, I come to this uh, in a unique situation in that I'm very close family with, with you, Jessica. Um, and I'm very interested. You mentioned intergenerational work. Um, I live in an 85 year old body. So I, I come to this um, awareness fairly late in my life. Um, Tim and Jessica are key teachers in my life now. It's kind of a, a turnaround and they have, um, I'm very conscious of the act of inner work that I am doing now <clears throat> around deep adaptation and preparation. Um, I'm not sure where the elderly fit into the act of work of preparing. Um, 
Yeah, I'm having a hard time articulating it. My work, as I have become a pupil of Tim and Jessica, my work is very internal. And, and as I meet all of the people through the forums, I have a sense of a lot of activity, important, incredible preparation activity. Whereas for me, old age is a very productive time, even though I find in the white North American culture, the elderly tend to be pushed aside, but I don't, I feel very, very involved in life, but at an internal level. And I'd like to hear what you have to say about intergenerational relations within this understanding of collapse. Yeah, that's a long way of asking my question. Yeah, I, I just, I really think it's so important when we gather to, to make sure there's representation, you know, at, at our monthly discussion groups, we kind of have at least three generations represented, you know, from the boomers to higher than the boomers and your generation um, to millennials, uh, not so much gen generation Z, you know, my, my daughter's generation, but just because there's this sense of, I think one of the problems is we've been really compartmentalizing learning and growth, you know, and, um, in the certainly in the west and education is always divided by ages and that it's so important that you're part of these discussions sandy whenever the opportunity arises um because young people i think they need to hear from older people that they recognize how difficult life is you know going to be for them and i think they're lacking they're really feeling like there's a tone deafness with older people that they just don't care um, because they're on their way out or something and they and it, it's your chance it's your turn to clean up the mess but I think it's so important for them to hear that you're doing that inner work that you're just as stunned as they are you know with what's what's happening to our world and you're grieving just as much um, and there's no there's no blame or there's no shame you know we're all part of systems of oppression we didn't create these systems we were born into them and that I think they need to hear that honesty from older people, not to shy away and not to say, oh, it's going to be okay. You just need to hope, you know, and be positive and think positive. I think that's, that's the danger. Um, and that's why I think young people kind of stay away and hesitate to be part of these, these wider circles. Um, but uh, yeah, there's absolutely um, a need for, for you to be involved um, and to have those conversations with younger people because they really are really scared and anxious um, and they want honesty. You know, they, they wanna hear things that are honest and sincere. Um, so I think that's a, that's a huge place. It's a huge part you can play. Uh, and the activity, I mean, I don't know. It's what you're interested what your interests are, you know, um, just holding space for people is a huge, a huge gift. Thank so you. I don't know if that, if that respond, no. if I responded. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So we have come to the end of our time together. Thank you very much, Jessica, for agreeing to join and for providing such a, a rich um, experience in the last hour. I'm really, really grateful. Well, again, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Stuart, for, for hosting and for inviting me. Um, and, uh, you know, I really look forward to continuing um, getting to know more people in the, in the forum and doing more, more interesting things.